No might, hide might, welcome. I'm Bruce Munro, and with me is International Relations Specialist, Professor Robert Patman, and this is Global Insight. The world held its breath for 24 hours this week when a Russian-made missile landed in Poland, killing two people. Urgent investigations suggested that the missile came from Ukraine, part of its air defence system gone wrong, and the public breathed a sigh of relief. But is that relief premature? Welcome, Robert. Right, Bruce. Russia says that the Polish missile strike shows that the West is edging closer to World War III. Ukraine's allies say that the death of the Poles is ultimately Putin's fault mm -hmm. for starting this war. Will this unintended missile strike have lasting repercussions? I think it will have lasting repercussions, and I don't think the repercussions will be favourable to Mr Putin's authoritarian regime. The Ukrainians have an extremely close relationship with Poland. Poland has been the staunchest supporter of Ukraine since the Russian invasion. Why? Because Poland has always said the invasion is not just about Ukraine, it's about the whole of Eastern Europe. That is, that if Ukraine buckles and is overrun, then Russians' ambitions won't be confined to Ukraine. So, uh, in that context, uh, it would appear, uh, what we know is the Russians launched a massive missile attack before the Ukrainian missile went into Polish airspace and tragically killed two people. And uh, the missile attack was spread across uh, Ukraine, but some of it was in western Ukraine, the area immediately adjacent to Poland. And there's no doubt about it that the Ukrainians don't have the most sophisticated air defence system in the world. It's, it's a Russian air defence system. And nevertheless, they tend to knock out about 80% of incoming missiles. What appears to have happened, according to the emerging evidence, and we don't have a definitive story yet, but what appears to happen is that the air defence missile either struck an incoming missile and was deflected into Poland, or it missed its target and travelled into Poland. So that's, you know, so it's a relief in one sense, it wasn't a direct Russian um, missile hitting Poland because that would have changed the scenario significantly. But this has really significant repercussions for Russia. Why? Because Mr. Slensky has been saying all along uh, that he needed more sophisticated air defence systems. Russia is trying to break the civilian infrastructure of Ukraine. Why is it trying to do that? Because it's getting battered on the battlefield. Um, it's losing the war on the ground. Um, it, since early September, Ukraine has recaptured 77,000 kilometres of territory. That's a lot of territory from the Russians. And it hasn't stopped at Kherson. The momentum is continuing. So Ru the Russian army is in disarray and getting pushed back. So Mr. Putin's gamble now is to step up missile attacks in order to destroy the energy system, the electrical grid. About 35% of Ukraine doesn't have any energy at the moment. It's getting very cold. It snowed in Kiev yesterday. Um, so the, the, the calculation here is to try to put pressure on the Slansky government via its citizens who are in enormous discomfort as a result of Russian attacks. In fact, the effect seems to be directly opposite. Many Ukrainians will say that there's no way, and particularly after these missile attacks on civilian facilities, will they ever give way to Russia. So it's probably hardening resolve. In addition, um, is all the signs are now that NATO and the United States are making available precisely those sophisticated air defence systems, which have been only given in very small amounts to Ukraine so far. Mr Putin faces the prospects that soon he won't be able to launch these sort of missile attacks because effectively um, the skies will be closed off to him. Uh, remember he hasn't got air superiority in terms of uh, fighter aircraft, so he's been relying heavily on missiles. Um, so you know, militarily uh, this could well blow back spectacularly for Mr Putin. And it also he launched the missile attack occurred. Um, while the CIA director, William Burns, was in Kyiv. Now, um, that wasn't necessarily deliberate because they've been carrying out these intensive missile attacks for some time. But what it does mean is the space for diplomatic negotiation has closed further still. 
I can't see a diplomatic solution now. I don't think it's ever been really realistically available uh, because you need the consent of the Ukrainians and they're not going to give an inch to the Russians. And they believe they've got the Russians on the ropes and they will not be, they don't see any incentive from a, a diplomatic point of view to concede any territory to Russia. When that missile struck in Poland, the G20 um, leaders went into an emergency round yeah. table because the, they were already gathered in Bali. Much is made of face-to-face -face meetings. Yeah. Is that justified? I, I think face-to-face -face meetings are very important in diplomacy. And we have to remember that Mr. Putin uh, did not attend the G20 meeting. Russia was represented by Sergei Lavrov. Um, and in a sense, um, Mr. Lavrov found himself in a very uncomfortable position. What he was able to do, though, one of the reasons that Russia did make sure it had formal representation was to block any joint declaration by the G20 condemning Russian invasion of Ukraine. They succeeded in that. Mr. Lavrov, simply being present, was able to block any um, declaration by the G20 group uh, condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine. If face-to-face -face meetings are important, could the COVID-19 pandemic be blamed for the war in Ukraine? You know, the idea that Putin perhaps wouldn't have invaded if global leaders hadn't been in a lockdown and unable to meet over a cuppa and chat things out. I don't agree with that. Um, this full-scale invasion that we're discussing, which began in February of this year, started in 2014, long before COVID. It started with the illegal annexation of Crimea. Um, and it was accompanied by a grumbling insurgency caused by Russian uh, incursions across the border into eastern Ukraine. So what we're seeing since the February 2022 is the culmination of an eight-year war. Ukraine and Russia have been at war for eight years before February uh, 2022, and 14,000 uh, people were killed in that conflict. Um, you, you, maybe Mr. Co maybe COVID-19 did affect the judgment of Putin. He became even more isolated, but I suspect it didn't really materially affect what happened. I think Mr. Putin, since 2008, has publicly gone on record as saying that he does not accept that Ukraine is a proper sovereign country. It is part of Russia, in his view. So in his view, he's not invading Ukraine. He's simply reclaiming what belongs to Russia. The problem is that about 42 million Ukrainians don't agree with them. You mentioned before about CIA Director William Burns mm. meeting with Vladimir Zelensky. He also met with Russia's top spy and with the Polish president. Mm. Is there something going on in the background here? He met with uh, Sergei Narushkin, who is uh, William Burns' counterpart. He's head of foreign intelligence in Russia. Um, no, uh, we now know that Mr. Burns, one intelligence professional to another, conveyed a warning to Mr. Putin not in any circumstances to contemplate a nuclear strike. And Mr. Burns was able to deliver that warning confident that the Chinese were supporting the Americans. The relationship between China and the United States has improved quite markedly, and that was evidently at the G20 meeting. And uh, there was another worrying thing here for Mr. Putin, as well as a, a big warning from the Americans and, and the Chinese about using nuclear weapons. Xi Jinping said, following the meeting in Bali, that Russia must respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Decoded, he's saying that Russia must go back to the internationally recognized boundaries of Russia and not try to annex territory from a neighboring country. So China has shifted in the course of this conflict. It, 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 there's always been divisions of opinion within the Chinese leadership. Xi Jinping has been pretty more pro-Putin than many of the others, but I think he's recognizing that China's prosperity hinges critically on its relationship with the United States and the legitimacy of the ruling Communist Party in Beijing depends on economic prosperity. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Catch us next time on Global Insight. Kaki te anō.